Okay, hello everyone, welcome. Uh, as John just said, this is my intro to DC electronics class. My goal here is not a comprehensive, you will know everything about electronics when you're done. It's just enough to get you the basic ideas of what is electricity, what's voltage, what's current, what, uh, how do you figure out what that is in an actual circuit? How do you take a schematic you find on the internet and actually start building something like it? So that's the general idea. And I will now remember how to use my laptop. Okay, so who am I and why should you trust me about this? Oh, did I just no. skip the slide? <laughs> no. Well, clearly you should not trust me about this. Uh, anyway, my name's Tim Anderson. I also go by Kiyoshigawa on the internet and have since I was 14 because I thought it sounded cool. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Um, I have a mechanical engineering bachelor's degree from the U. Uh, I've been a founding and active member of many hacker spaces over the last decade. And I, in that time, I have self-taught myself a whole lot about electronics, PCB design, and programming. So that's my qualifications. Hopefully, I come across as coherent and sane. I know there's a few people in here that know more about this than I do. So I'm sure if I make a mistake, they will point it out. Uh, let's see, click on that screen. Okay, so here's the overview of what I'm hoping to cover today. The first topic is just a general idea of what is electricity. I will be using a bunch of fluid analogies to hopefully make it a bit more intuitive for you to understand with something you might be more familiar with. It may help, it may not. Um, the, one of the biggest things, the majority of this class will be on how to read electrical schematics and take that and build an actual circuit from that. Um, another topic I'll cover is voltage and current more specifically, as well as using a multimeter. And then I'll get into, towards the end, a bit of simple math that will make working with circuits much easier for reasons you will discover. So do a click and a scroll. So we'll start with what is electricity? And according to, well, the main definition says it's the flow of electrical charge through a medium, but for the purposes of what we deal with most of the time, it's gonna be free electrons moving along conductive materials. So the analogy that most of my fluid analogies will be based on is water flowing through a pipe, where water is analogous to electrons and pipe is the conductive material that the electrons move through. Okay, so two topics that are central to pretty much anything you ever do with electronics will be voltage and current. Voltage is defined as the electric potential difference across two points and current is defined as the flow of the electrical charge through the conductor. So in a fluid analogy, voltage is like pressure and current is like flow. And now I'm going to jump into schematics because discussing voltage and current is much easier when you can read a schematic. So that is my next step. So I'm sure if you've ever looked up electronics on the internet, you've probably seen some of these symbols and wondered exactly what they are or what they mean, how to work with them. I will now go over them in general. So. This here is a representation of a battery. You can see this shows two battery cells, typically, where like if you have two double A's next to each other in a row, this would be the schematic representation of batteries. This is called a voltage source. You can see it, oh, and same with the batteries. You can see there's a positive side and a negative side. A voltage source is, I'll cover, more of what that means later, but essentially that's kind of like an electricity pump. Um, this is a current source. They're basically not real. You don't ever run into them in the real world, but you'll see them in schematics and textbooks all the time. I show it to you so you can be aware of what it looks like. Also in both these cases, this is DC voltage, which just means it's a constant pressure being applied to the circuit, essentially. 
If you see a wavy line, that means it's AC, which is way outside the bounds of what I'm intending to talk about today. Moving down to the next line, you'll see four different symbols that all mean ground. Um, it depends on what you're looking at as to why they're different symbols. This one, you can see there's three lines on top of each other. This one is a triangle. Sometimes they denote a separate ground with an A or they note it as analog ground. That's for stuff like audio or other sensitive readings where you want the ground to be clean and not interfered with by adjacent signals like digital stuff that's changing up and down really quickly. Um, this one is typically for like chassis grounds where like you'll see it in automotive schematics a lot. Uh, yeah, moving on. These two symbols here are the same symbol. One is the European version of a resistor, one's the American version of a resistor. They're both about equally common online. So when you see those, think resistor. These next two symbols are potentiometers. So this is a resistor that has a tap. So you can select two resistance values from the middle of the total resistance. Uh, I probably won't cover too much of that. These down here at the bottom are capacitors. You'll note capacitors come in three different shapes. One, you can see it doesn't have a plus or minus depending on the type of capacitor. They may be directional. Sometimes you have to orient them the correct way or they explode. Other times you can put them in forward or backward and they don't care. Um, this little curly wire symbol is called an inductor. It's a coil of wire that I won't be covering at all in the class, really. These next ones up here, like these, so you've got LEDs, which you're probably all familiar with. They're the little things that light up. Um, this, so LEDs will typically have arrows pointing out of a triangle with a line on it. The triangle with a line is the symbol for just a diode, and a an light emitting diode has the arrows to indicate that something is leaving the diode, in this case light. Um, RGB LEDs are also very common to see in schematics. That's just three diodes. Sometimes they're connected at the negative side or cathode. Sometimes they're all connected at the positive side, and they would have three inputs. It just depends on what kind of RGB LEDs you buy. And I know I'm throwing a lot of words out, and probably not a lot of them make sense, but hopefully they will as I go on further. This one you'll see in old schematics all the time is a lamp, or sometimes it looks kind of like a little candle thingy. Um, and then, yeah, oh, up here, so that's just a regular diode. Diodes are kind of like one-way gates, essentially, where electricity will only flow through them one direction, and in the other direction it stops. Uh, Zener diodes are a special kind of diode where that is no longer the case and electricity can flow backwards through them at a specific voltage. So um, here I've got three kinds of switches. So the first kind of switch is called a single pull, single throw. And that is just essentially a wire that when you push the switch down, connects, and when you release, opens. You can also have a different kind of switch called a single pull double throw, where if the wire is open, one leg's connected, and if the wire is closed, another leg's connected. And then they keep getting bigger and more complicated from there. For instance, this is a double pull double throw, where if you move the switch, it has two single pull double throw switches inside it. So when the switch is up, both of these legs are connected, and when the switch is down, both of the other legs are connected. Um, this here is a speaker that shows up all the time in online schematics. And finally, anything complicated ends up being a box with a bunch of labels on it. In this case, it's an AT tiny microprocessor, but there will be thousands of different kinds of things in schematics that are just represented by a box with a name. So you can look up the part number and its data sheet and that will tell you all about what it actually is. Um, and now I will click again and you will see the first thing that came up on Google when I searched for schematic images. So there's so many things that are represented this way. The key points to take away is that uh, 
when you're looking at a schematic, if you see a symbol you don't know, you can probably just Google schematic symbols, and if it's common, it'll pop up, and if it's not, there should be a label in the schematic with a part number that tells you what it is, so you can look up a data sheet and figure it out. So now that you know what the symbol names are, I will move on to talking about uh, two different paradigms that you're likely to see in schematics. So sometimes you'll see a schematic where wires cross like this, and then you'll see other wire crossings with a dot. If there is a dot on your schematic, you're probably using this paradigm for the whole thing, wherein this dot means that the wire is connected to all these components, and this means that the wires cross without connecting. There is a separate paradigm where if you don't see any dots in your schematic that any wires touching each other are connected and if they're jumping you'll have a little loopy jump over them. So look at your whole schematic and figure out which one of these two you're using. I've never seen one use both at the same time so it's one or the other and that will help you figure out what's connected to what. Now. Uh, doo -doo -doo, sorry, I'm bad at using a computer. So, now I've given you a simple schematic of an LED connected to a battery with a resistor. So, here I've got this, oh, whoops. Doo -doo -doo. Do you want to zoom in on me? So, I have a battery pack here that has, inside of it are four AAA batteries, as well as an on-off switch. So I know it's kind of hard to see what's going on here, but there's just four, tri or, okay, go back to the presentation. So I have four battery cells that are connected in series, which just means negative to positive, negative to positive over and over again. And then I have an on-off switch at the end which is here. So that's all represented by everything in this blue rectangle is just my batteries. Um, the batteries have a negative side which is the black wire and a positive side which is the red wire. That's a typical convention for DC. It's not always correct but it's the most common one that you will see. In addition to that I have a resistor and an LED. And then I have wires that say connect the positive side of the battery to one leg of the resistor and then another wire that connects the other leg of the resistor to an LED and the final wire connects the anode or positive, or sorry, cathode or negative side of the LED, I said that backwards, to the wire that returns to the negative side of the battery. So let me do some wiggling. I want to make sure I haven't forgotten anything by reading my notes. Sorry, I'm a terrible presenter. So this is a simple schematic that goes battery, resistor, LED, back to ground, all just connected with a loop of wire. When I click to the next slide, this is the exact same schematic. So each battery is 1.5 volts. When you add them all together, you get a total of six. I'll cover voltage and how it works in a minute, but take my word for it for now. Um, then you've got this time an American resistor that is connected to the positive side of the battery, see the plus, and the other leg of the resistor is connected to the LED and the LED is connected back to the negative side of the battery. Now what you'll see on both of these schematics is that I have attached a ground reference there. And ground is basically just a fancy way of arbitrarily saying the voltage here is zero. So you just pick a spot on your circuit and the voltage is zero. Typically you'll see that on the negative terminal of your voltage source or a battery. It's not always there, but that's the most common place. So whenever you see ground, all you have to remember is the voltage here is zero and everything else I say tonight should start making some sense. Oh, whoops, I went too far. Okay, so the next thing I want to cover is called nodes. And a node is just a fancy way of saying these parts of the component are connected by a conductive material. In our case, a wire. 
So there are three nodes in this schematic. The first node connects the positive side of the battery to one side of this resistor. So that would be a single node. A second node is connecting this side of the resistor to that leg of the LED. That's the only things connected by a single conductor in this schematic, so that's node number two. And then the final node would be this one is connected to ground, which is just a reference marker. So it's not an actual component. So it's connected to ground and also to the negative end of your battery. So when I scroll down like I did before, you can see you've got your one node here, one node there, and one node here. And they're separated by components. So the key to taking this schematic and actually building it is being able to look at it and say, all these things are connected to each other, and the nodes are broken into these parts. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So now that you've got a general idea of what all the picture names are and what it kind of means to connect them, you want to build that circuit in the real world. So there are three common ways to build circuits in the real world. The first, that is what I'll be doing tonight, is called breadboarding. And I'll go over what these guys are in more depth on the next slide. The second way is called protoboarding, which is kind of a more permanent way where you solder components onto a board that has conductive, uh, what you call it. So there's a bunch of little circles of metal and you would solder components into them and connect them to each other. I actually have the circuit as a breadboard here without the battery that you can pass around and look at while I'm talking. And the final one would be to design a printed circuit board, which basically is like the protoboard breadboard, but you pay someone or do it yourself to etch away copper so that the wires are built into the board and you just attach components to it. So each of these little lines here is a copper trace, and each of these dark areas has had the copper etched away chemically, so there's nothing conductive there, but the copper will connect, say, this pin over to this pin here. So anyway, back to breadboarding. This is the least permanent and most accessible type of kind of circuit building. Now this can confuse people at first. So you've got a typical layout of a breadboard and what it looks like in real life, there's a little plastic board with a bunch of square holes in the top that you can insert components into each hole. And what you're seeing up here is the typical connectivity for a breadboard. So this blue line means that underneath the plastic top of the breadboard, all the holes that touch that blue line are connected to each other. It's essentially a wire that has little springy, grabby metal bits in it. So that when you stick something into that hole, if you stick something else into another hole that's connected to that blue line, they'll be connected electrically as if there was a wire directly attached to the legs of that component. The same is true for the red line next to it. You'll note that this blue line and this blue line are both blue, however they are not automatically connected. Depending on, <laughs> excuse me, depending on where you get your breadboards, some of them may stop in the middle, so the red and the blue lines may not be connected all the way to both ends. If you ever run into trouble with your circuits, make sure to double check that blue and red lines, I call them the voltage rails on your breadboard, go all the way down. Also in field, you'll see there's a bunch of five pin groups, each connected by a green line. Each of these lines, the five holes here are connected to each other and the five holes here are connected to each other. They're not connected across the aisle in the center. They're not connected to the rails at all. So you just have, on most breadboards, there's a numbers, typically you'll see 30 to 60 rows of five pin groups that are connected to each other. 
Does that make sense? Everybody following connectivity for breadboards? Okay. So now we want to take our schematic, which was from the battery to one leg of the resistor. So, and here you can see kind of what's inside the battery box. So you have the negative side of the battery is the flat one and the positive side has the bump on it. So you've got negative to positive goes through a piece of metal, negative to positive through a piece of metal, negative to positive through a piece of metal, negative to positive, and then out. On my battery, I have a switch here and all that switch does is disconnect the red wire or reconnect it. So when the switch is off, the wire is disconnected and the electrons don't have anywhere to go, so they get stuck. When the switch is closed, the wire is whole and the electrons can flow down it. So back to our schematic, we go from the positive end of our battery block, and that's connected to this red rail, which is connected to all of these pins on the bottom row here. From there, I've added a jumper wire, which connects this rail to this row here. If you can see, there's a very faint number 60. So this is row 59 on my breadboard. So that means that the positive terminal of this battery is connected to both this rail here as well as this whole row. And since on my schematic I need to connect the positive battery to a resistor through a wire, that has been accomplished by this configuration. The next part of the schematic showed the other leg of the resistor being connected to the positive side of the LED. So I'm going to go for, oh, sorry, I need to go backwards a bit. So here you can see, again on the LED, the big bar represents the negative side or cathode, and the wide side of the triangle represents the positive side. So resistors almost always don't have a direction. You can put it in backwards and it will never care. With diodes, you need to make sure you get the direction correct because diodes work like one-way gates. And if your cathode is pointing towards the positive side, current won't be able to flow unless you put so much pressure against it that it breaks, which nobody really wants. So back to this side, you can see here that um, on this graphic representation of the LED, there's a longer leg. And typically, when you're dealing with LEDs in the real world, they look like this. One leg will always be longer than the other. That's how you can tell which side is the positive side and which side's the negative. Um, also, depending on the type of LED, if the legs are the same size, you may notice that the top has a flat side on it. That flat side corresponds with the cathode and is typically negative. So nine times out of 10, when you're working in circuits, if you put an LED in backwards, it just won't light up and you need to reverse it. If you're starting to deal with very high voltages, then you can blow them up. But most people's first projects won't be in that range, so you're unlikely to damage them. So our yellow node, the middle one, takes the positive leg of the LED and attaches it to the second leg of the resistor. You'll note that it is all five of the holes in this breadboard are connected to that same node, but it's only using two of them because essentially wires are ideal conductors for the most part in typical circuits, even though in reality they have a resistance. It's so small compared to everything else, you can ignore it. The final leg of the circuit takes the negative leg of the LED, the short one or the one with the square side, and connects it so I'm jumping it through another jumper wire, which is just, again, an ideal conductor to connect this node to the negative leg of the battery node, which is connected to this whole rail. And then that completed our whole circuit. So now I'm going to come over here on the monitor and build that circuit in an actual breadboard so you can see what's happening. So I start with the battery, or, oh, wrong battery. I start with the battery and I take the red and black wires. Oh, sorry, my hand is in the way. So if you look closely here, you should be able to see that the red wire is connected to the rail on the red side and the black wire is connected to the rail on the blue side. There's nothing inherent about the breadboard that requires you to put them in the right way. 
everybody just does it because it kind of makes sense. So make sure you pay attention to that. If you want to do anything other than negative on the blue rail and positive on the red rail, you'll probably just confuse yourself later. The next step, so I know on the picture I showed up on the board before, I used a jumper wire to go from the red rail to infield, but that is not technically necessary. So I can just take one leg of the resistor and plug it into the red rail, and then I can put the other leg of the resistor anywhere on that circuit board. So if you can see there, I've got one leg of the wire is in the red rail, and the other one is in row 24. Then I need to connect the second leg of the resistor to the long leg of the LED. So to connect that, I put it in the same row, 24, and the other leg of the LED connects to ground. And as you can see, as soon as I plugged it in, the LED lit up because electrons now have somewhere to flow. So that works for that for now. So that hopefully made sense going from the pictogram schematics, knowing what the components are, which legs are attached, uh, attached to what by identifying nodes of connected materials and then translating that into the real world and building a circuit. So where am I going here? Okay, so now the next thing, if you'll go back to the slides, John. Uh, let's see, yeah, got, yeah, I covered all that. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is change up my schematic. Let's say I don't want one LED, but I want two. So what I've done is this top part is the exact same schematic I had before, but I've added two new parts to it. This one is another resistor, just like the first one. And this is another LED, just like the first one. So what I've got here is what's called in parallel. So they both start at the positive battery and end at the negative battery, but they're not connected anywhere in the middle. They're side by side or in parallel. The reason to do this, I'll cover more once we understand more about voltage and current. Long story short, it's harder to set things on fire if you go in parallel than it would be if you were doing it in a different configuration. So back to the node concept. Before we had the node that was the positive battery terminal, ah, terminal is connected to one leg of a resistor. Now we've added to that same node an extra resistor leg. And if you'll remember, that was our red rail on the breadboard. We also have this same node here before. The other leg of the first resistor is connected to the positive side of an LED. We have a new node that's not connected to anything before. It's connected to the other leg of the second resistor and this side of the LED. So even though they look the same, this inside part isn't connected at all to that inside part, I guess. Hopefully that made sense. Um, then our third node used to just be the negative side of one LED connected to the negative side of the battery, which we call ground. We have added the second LED, which is also connected to that, which you should remember is the rail down the blue side on the breadboard. So I will go back to... So on that previous slide, would you say that was four nodes? Yes, four nodes. So you have node one, node two, three, and then four is here. And three of those nodes were the same as before, so I don't need to change that part. I just added additional components to the nodes I already have which is what you should see here. So before we had, the first node was this rail, and the second node was just this line connecting the resistor to the LED, and the third node was the negative side connected to the other blue rail for the negative battery terminal. So when I added the other one, I added a connection to the first rail, which is one side of the resistor, and I added a connection to the second rail which was the negative side of the diode, and then I have a fourth brand new node that's only connecting 
that leg of the resistor to that leg of the diode. So now I will build that in on the breadboard. So again, this part can all stay here because I didn't change what was connected to those nodes. I'm just adding a new connection, which goes from the positive side to the long leg of the LED. So if you can see there, kind of hard with the glare, but there's a longer leg of the LED that connects to the resistor side. And then the other leg of the LED connects to ground. And as you can see, as soon as I made the connection, the second LED lit up. So hopefully that was clear enough to get you the idea of going from a schematic to the physical world and kind of understanding how components connect to each other. Any questions on that concept so far? Nope. Okay. How do I make them blink? That's for <laughs> another class. Actually, do you have any inductors <laughs> with you? No. Yeah. Well, no. Because no. I've got capacitors, and we could make blinking. Yeah. <laughs> there are ways to do it, but the easiest way is to buy a microcontroller and program it to blink. Or ang. Yes. Yeah. But easy. You keep saying okay. the word cathode. Ca I don't know what a cathode means. Okay, cathode just means the negative side of a diode, okay. and anode means the positive side of a diode. So the cathode is the side with the line. Sorry. And if I say words that you don't understand, please yell at me because I forget which words are common and which words are important. Sorry. So, oh. You might cover this in the future, but a resistor is mostly to try and control the, the current. Yeah. So now that we're comfortable with the schematics, I'm about to get back into definitions on everything. So you, that means that you're going exactly where I hoped you would be going. Okay, so back to the three magic words of today's lesson, voltage, current, and resistance. Um, the voltage, as I said way back when, is the electric potential difference across two points. And the most important word here is across. So voltage is an across variable, which means it's always measured from one point to another point. Um, the unit for voltage is a volt. It uses a symbol V. So when you see some spec online that says like 19.5 V, that means 19 and a half volts. That's typical in Dell power supplies. Um, a 1.5 volt AA battery provides an ideal voltage of 1.5 volts. In reality, it's usually a bit more or less than that, which we'll see when I get into the next section. So the fluid analogy for voltage is pressure. And a battery or a voltage source is essentially a pump. So you've got a pipe full of water, and you put a pump on the bottom. The water on one side will be at a lower pressure than the water on the other side of that pump. And the pump doesn't let water flow backwards through it unless you have more pressure pushing than the pump can push back, if that makes sense. So. Electrically, when you see a voltage source or a battery, you can assume that it's trying to push the electrons in the positive direction around the loop. And now, if any of you have taken physics classes, you will be cringing that I said push the electrons in that direction <laughs> because back when they were discovering electricity, they arbitrarily decided that electrons should be positive, and then they later found out they were wrong. So the, <laughs> whenever I say current is flowing in a direction or the positive side of the voltage, in the real physical world, everything is backwards and the electrons are going the other way. But as far as the math and how it all works out, you can ignore that unless you're building electromagnets, which is way outside the scope of this class. So just stow in the back of your head that electrons are physically moving in the opposite direction that all of the arrows and the numbers show, and then forget about it forever unless you're building magnets. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, back to voltage. Kind of makes sense that if you have a pump, it's trying to push the water in a certain direction, and the amount of voltage is how hard it's pushing, essentially. The next slide says, oh, right. Okay, I forgot how I set this up. So how do you measure voltage? You want to know what the voltage of something is, you use a voltmeter. 
which sounds kind of funny, but typically you find a voltmeter as part of a multimeter, which if you're working with electronics, this is the most practical, useful tool you could ever own. So they come in many shapes and sizes. Starting here with the bottom of the barrel, you can get these from Harbor Freight pretty much for free whenever you want. Just look for a coupon. Not on sale, they cost about three or four dollars. There's a reason why they're that cheap, and it's mostly bad parts, no fuses, and they fall apart often. Um, if you dig around in, say, your parent or grandparent's basement, you may find a multimeter that looks like this with an actual needle dial on it. They're not very common at all anymore. The digital ones are cheaper. If you're buying new, I definitely don't recommend one. But if you happen to have one, you can probably make it work. Um, this one I linked on the description on Meetup. It is $20 on Amazon. They're everywhere and they work for 90% of the things you could ever want to do with a multimeter. If you're buying your first multimeter, something in this ballpark is what I would recommend. And then this one is a rated UL listed high-end multimeter, not top of the line, but it has more features than this one would. This one is not very good at measuring capacitance, which again, I'm not really covering in this class, but if you need something on the higher end, something along these lines is what you'll end up with. So I'm now going to demonstrate using multimeters on our circuit. So let's do a click down here to bring the circuit back up. And if you will switch to this device. So as you can see here, I've got the multimeter. And can you guys read the dial clearly for what all the letters show around here? Yes. OK. Yeah. So the symbol for voltage is a capital V. And you can see here that this multimeter shows V with both a wavy line and the DC symbol, which is the solid line with the dashed line under it. So that means that this will measure AC or DC voltage, as well as VFD, which is too fancy to cover. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so if you set this to the V mode, it will bring up a number on the screen. And right now, my probes, which are plugged in here, Oh, I should cover this part first. If you look at where the probes are plugged in, I have the back uh, black probe plugged in to where it says common. And you can see a little similar to the ground sign there. But you don't have to keep this grounded. Multimeters will float freely. So you won't blow them up by poking ground into something that isn't ground. What will blow them up is if you go over the voltage ratings written on them. So. If you look underneath here, you can see that this multimeter, can you read that or should I zoom? OK, let me attempt to zoom. OK, so you've got here 300 volts category 4, 600 volts category 3, and 1 kilovolt category 2. So. That is the voltage rating for this multimeter. So basically, if I take these two probes and I stick them in something that's one kilovolt, it will probably blow a fuse in here, but it won't kill me. <laughs> How much is the wall? The wall runs at 120 volts AC. So I can stick these probes in the wall and measure AC voltage there if I want to. And I'm comfortable do doing. With the Harbor Freight yeah, ones. I'm they comfortable doing hot. it with this multimeter. The Harbor Freight ones <laughs> do not have fuses, so I do not recommend sticking them in anything. Can't do it. They just get hot and then melt. Yeah. <laughs> so, the nice multimeters have like actual rated protection that you will need if you're working with high voltages. When you're working with hobby electronics, five volt DC stuff, LEDs. Harbor Freight probably isn't going to explode unless you try pretty hard. So that's one of the advantages of having a nice multimeter. What do the different categories mean by that? Those are like electrical protection ratings. I'm not totally up to speed on that. Are there any electricians around? They have that shit memorized. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to research that and post something on the video if I remember. Sorry. 
But long story short, as long as I'm under 300 volts, I feel pretty comfortable sticking these probes into whatever I feel like. Um, the other two holes on the bottom of here, one is for milliamps or microamps, which is the unit of current. I'll cover how that side works later. There's also a separate hole for amps. So for those unfamiliar with metric prefixes, milliamps are 1,000 times smaller than an amp, and microamps are 1,000 times smaller than a milliamp, or what, 10 to the 6 smaller than an amp. So. Typically current in amps is for big things like motors, current in milliamps is for things like LEDs, and microamps is for things like logic signals on a computer. And I'll talk more about that later. One thing you can see here as well is that there's a max milliamp rating on the milliamp microamp port. So this comes into what I'll be covering, oh sorry, screen. I guess you're not even looking at my laptop screen, so it doesn't matter. Anyway, this goes into more of what I'll be covering as we move forward. Uh, is my multimeter going to sleep? No, no oh. that's fine. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, so don't exceed the amperage ratings. Again, this one has fuses in it that I can replace. The Harbor Freight one doesn't, and it just burns itself to death, which is why it only costs $3. So on my big amp reading, I can get up to 10 amps, but it's not as precise as the smaller one for low numbers of current. And that's just in how the multimeter is built. So this one has a lot more precision than the other. Anyway, I'm going to return back to our example here. So I've got the knob on the voltage switch. And let's say, as I mentioned before, voltage is an across variable. So to measure voltage, you want to measure it across two points. So what I'm going to do is touch this node here on one leg of the resistor and this other node there on the other leg of the resistor. And what you'll see is the number 2.722 and the little DC sign auto up at the top. So what that's telling me is that it's automatically found the right range, it's a DC voltage, and it's 2.72 volts. So this multimeter has a range button there, so I can kind of manually set the range, and only some of them work. Uh, there you go. But most of the time it's on auto ranging, and it will find, how do I get back to auto? Do I have, oh, I have to reset it to get back to auto. Anyway, so the nicer multimeters will all automatically range and find it. When I switch to the other multimeters to show you, you'll see why that's convenient. Um, another mode, here I have a select button. So now you saw that DC symbol changed to the wiggly line which represents AC. And since the voltage is constant in DC, instead of with AC where it's going up and down all the time, I get a reading of zero volts because there's no up and down for it to measure on AC. So if you're trying to measure a voltage and you're not getting things that make sense, check to make sure your multimeter's in DC mode. Um, oh, and we're back to DC auto. So DC auto, you can see there's 2.7 volts across the resistor. You can also notice that it's been changing a little bit as I measure it. That's fairly typical because the batteries are not a perfect voltage source and they're always losing power slowly over time as they operate. That's a chemical property of batteries. If you have like a benchtop power supply or like your computer power supply, the voltage should remain more constant if not exactly what you want. So if you have like five volts is what USB power runs on, that should be pretty close to five volts all the time without the slow degradation you get from batteries. Um, making sense so far as far as measuring voltage, but not what it means yet. <laughs> okay, so now that you've seen the good multimeter, I'm going to quickly show you the other multimeters. So this one here, instead of having just one button for voltage, AC and DC, you can see on the labels there are several settings for DC voltage, 10, 25, 50, 250, and 500. 
There's also a separate area for AC voltage, which is probably really hard to read, but it says 500, 250, and 50. There's a third area that's for DC milliamps, and again, they have that category two rating and 250 milliamps max value on this one. So pay attention to your max ratings. I'll be helping you figure out how many amps and volts you have typically as we go through the rest of the presentation. But what I really want you to see on this needled one is how much more of a pain it is than a digital one, as well as kind of give you an idea of why these numbers exist. So what each of these numbers are on multimeters that don't have auto ranging is the maximum voltage that they can measure. So if my maximum voltage is 10 volts, when you look up here on the dial, under the DC voltage or milliamps tag, you've got zero and then two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. So when I go to measure the voltage across this resistor, which has fallen off the screen, sorry. So I'm measuring the same voltage I did before. Okay, so that time you saw I put the black on the red rail and the red on the other one. And what the needle did is it flipped backwards. So that's showing you that voltage is directional and it goes from positive to negative. So when you're putting your probes on things, put black on the negative side and red on the positive side if you want to get a positive voltage reading. Uh, anyway, if you look on the dial there, you can see that you're at about 2.5 on the needle on that bottom track. So now, if I were to switch it to the 25 volt rail, it's going to show, so this one only goes 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. It will be half of what that range says when I measure with this. So you're seeing I'm getting like, a, what? 5 on the scale that goes 10, 20, 30, so it's actually under 2, or 2 and a half ish Which is, again, why the digital ones are better, but if this is all you have, it'll get you close enough. You'll also notice that the higher ranged ones, like the 250, if I measure it, you don't even see it move. You can kind of see the needle wiggling a teeny tiny bit, but you get a lot less accurate if you're outside of the range that's closest to the maximum that you'll need. So for five volt circuits, you'd wanna keep this on 10 so that your reading is as accurate as it can be without exceeding the 10. If you put it on a setting that it goes over, if you have a nicer multimeter, you'll just blow a fuse or it will flip the needle all the way up and nothing terribly bad will happen. If you have a Harbor Freight multimeter and you go way over the voltage rating that you're set on, then it will once again catch fire. So be careful with that. Um, now I will show this one is the other one. It basically works the same way as the fancy expensive one I have for a tenth of the price. So as you can see, I'm on DC voltage. When I touch the LED, you get 2.67 volts, which is very close to the 2.7 volts we started with on the blue one. Also, I can demonstrate, which I should have done before, if I reverse the probes, I get negative 2.67 volts. So pay close attention to sign. All that means, if you look at what I'm doing, is that if you have a negative voltage, it just means the voltage at the black terminal is higher than the voltage at the red terminal. So negative 2.67 is the same as 2.67 if you flip the probes. And hopefully that makes enough sense, right? Okay, the last thing I'll show you is the Harbor Freight multimeter if it wants to work with me. <laughs> After class. <laughs> so here you can see there's DC voltage ranges again. So you have 200 millivolts, which is a thousandth of a volt. So that would be 0.2 volts as a maximum. If I were to try and connect it to here, it would not have a good time. Then you see 2,000 millivolts, which is 2 volts as a maximum, which again would be a bit too low for what we're measuring. 
So I go all the way up to 20 volts on the ranging. Then, oh, this one has a hard on off switch, which is very stiff. So now I will once again measure the voltage there and I get 2.66. So even though it is cheap, it still gives you correct values if you use it well and manage not to set it on fire. <laughs> so it's not a worthless device, just be aware that it has its limitations and it is very easy to set on fire. I have destroyed at least three of these accidentally, so <laughs> you've been warned and I will now continue on with the class if I can unlock my laptop. Okay. So we're back here, we've measured, oh, we've measured a voltage, but not all of the voltages. So I guess I kind of want to give you a general idea of what the real circuit voltages look like, and then we'll go into ideals when we start doing calculations. So back to here, if I set this, I'm going to zoom out a little again. Is that easier to see? So I set it to voltage. Now we've been measuring the voltage across this one resistor the whole time, and now this one is also down to 2.661. We can also measure the voltage across the LED, so I'm going to switch the probes to go from positive to negative, and we get 2.991. And then if we measure the voltage across the battery terminals, we can measure it here at the battery, and we get 5.652. We can also measure it from the top leg of the resistor to the bottom leg of the LED and get the exact same value. Well, close enough. So the reason for that is because these legs are connected to the battery. It's all one node. So anywhere on that node you measure voltage, you should get the same value as if you're anywhere else. If in reality, if you have like a ground line that's many feet long, you'll start to see voltage drops across the conductor because conductors aren't ideal and you, the electrons can't move freely through them unless you're dealing with superconductors. So if you measure the voltage from the uh, one, I'm trying to remember the terms, uh, on, along the same uh, node, uh huh. Uh, from like one of the resistors. Yeah, so if you want LED, this you resistor want. here to the other resistor, you get 5.6. If you go from <coughs> here to the same leg of the resistor, it is zero. Okay. So anything on that node, even way down here, you see it's still zero volts. Because so, the difference, yeah. The difference is the yeah, same. there's no difference the from in the same node, the difference in voltage is zero. So voltage is always across components between nodes. So is the voltage going across the resistor and going across the LED, those two voltages individually added up equals that whole? That yes, line. so that is the last thing I will talk about today, which is Kirchhoff's voltage law. So once I get into the math, you'll start seeing how all these numbers add together and how you can find numbers you don't know once you get there. So. Um, another thing to note is that the voltage across this LED, the blue one, is 2.99 volts, and the voltage across this red LED actually comes in at 2.065 volts. And that's kind of an inherent property of LEDs. Typically, the closer to infrared you are on the spectrum, the lower the voltage will be, and the closer to ultraviolet, the higher the voltage will be. And that's a physical property because the light requires more energy to activate. So uh, when you get down to it in the silicone of the LED, there's a very small gap that electrons are jumping across, and as they jump across, that sends off a photon in a specific frequency depending on the material and the size of the gap. So that's a whole lot of physics stuff that doesn't matter for what we're talking about here, but might be interesting if you're curious. And the point to take away is that LEDs will typically have a fixed voltage depending on their color in order to light up. It's not exactly that voltage, but if you buy LEDs, you'll get a data sheet and there's a little chart that says current versus uh, voltage that you can look up so you can figure out what your 
LED's voltage drop will be. Alternatively, you can just plug it into a circuit that looks exactly like this and measure it, which is much faster and usually more accurate. So, um, everybody comfortable with how to measure voltage? Roughly. Okay, let's go back to slides and we will now move on to current. So current is, as I mentioned at the very beginning, the flow of electrical charge through a conductor. So current, the key word is through. It is a through variable. And that means that current isn't like from one node to another. Current goes through a component. So um, yeah, you don't measure it in the same way as voltage, which I'll show you in a second. The units for current are called amperes, which is almost always just shortened to amp or amps. The symbol for that is the letter A, and in your fluid analogy, that is the rate of flow. So the pump generates a pressure that wants to push water, and as long as that water has somewhere to go, the water flowing through the pipe is your flow. So in electricity, we're pretty much only dealing with closed circuits, so the pipe will come out of the top of the pump, loop back around, and stick into the bottom. And the pump makes it possible for the water to make that journey by putting a pressure or a force on that water to get it to go. So your battery is kind of pushing electrons through your wire, and the electrons that are moving are your flow. Again, I'm going to get physics-y for a second. The actual physical electrons aren't running down the pipe at full speed. It's very chaotic, and they kind of bump into each other. So imagine like a big pipe completely full of ping pong balls with just a little bit of wiggle room and your pump is just shoving a few more ping pong balls in one end and the ping pong balls at the other end of the pipe will start to move because they have to since there's nowhere for them to stay. So it's not the same physical electron at the battery that runs all the way around the loop and goes back. Uh, electrons tend to move at like a few centimeters a second at the voltages we're dealing with, but the signal that says electrons are flowing in this direction moves at the speed of light. So when you think about it, you can imagine the electrons running really fast, but again, just keep it in the back of your head that physically the electrons aren't detaching from their atoms and booking it. They're kind of bouncing into each other and shoving each other down a very crowded area. Um, go ahead. No, so it's always free electrons on the atoms in outer orbitals for conductive materials, but it's, they do move from atom to atom, they just don't go all the way. Yeah. They're there's called the electron C, right? Yeah. For there's metal, all metals are, are more of an electron C. You're used to like the, the symbol where, you know, like there's an orbit. Um, that's usually referring to like organic chemicals, but metals are not real. Their electrons are just loose and floating yeah, around. Yeah, they're technically attached, but if there's something else they can attach to, they'll just kind of roll over into it. Yeah. That's the. Know more about it, Google the electron C. Yeah, there's lots of physics professors who are As much better uh, at this than I am. Ochem professor um, said uh, electrons and metals are pores. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah. So, does the fluid analogy and the electron C kind of make sense as a concept? And the current is the flow of the electrons, even if not literal, it's just the amount that they're inclined to move around. The higher the current, the more electrons are moving. So now we go on to measuring current. So I'll leave the schematic back up. John, if you would like to engage projector again. Um, so like I said, current is a through variable. So if I want to measure current, I can't just touch wires in a circuit like I do for voltage. I have to insert my meter 
in the way of that current so that the electrons will flow through the meter in order to measure it. So like if you have a, call it a river, with a stick and a sign and a spring, if the river's flowing quickly, that will lean more that way because it's pushing the stick in the current. If the river's flowing slowly, it won't lean as much. That's essentially the analogy for an amp meter. So basically, you have to make sure that the electrons are flowing through your meter, which is too complicated to get into how it works electrically, but that's the general idea in order to measure it. So since current is a through variable, it uses a different way of measuring. So on my nice multimeter, I have to completely remove it from the voltage hole and put it in the, I'm gonna say for safety, always start with the biggest current. And now my nice multimeter here is giving me a warning saying, hey, you're in current mode and you're on the voltage setting, don't do that. So if I come all the way over here to the one that says for amps or milliamps, the beeping stops because I'm in the correct hole. On the cheaper multimeters, you will not get warnings like that. You will just start fires, so. <laughs> now again, in order for this to work, you have to insert your multimeter into the circuit. So even if I touch this, it's gonna say there is almost no current flowing through here because it's easier to go through a wire than it is to go through a meter. Yeah, and electrons are lazy and want to get where they're going as easily as possible. So what I do is I physically open up the circuit and move the resistor to another node. So is that clear on the screen what I've done? Where you've got one leg of the resistor in this row and the or sorry, one leg of the LED in this row and the leg of the resistor in another row. Now, when I touch this side with the black probe and this side with the red probe, the electrons have to flow through my meter in order to measure the current. And as you can see there, I have negative because I put the black probe on the positive side and the red probe on the negative side, I have negative 13, or 0.013 amps, which tells me that if I wanted to, I could take this out and plug it into the hole that says max 600 milliamps because I only have 13 milliamps. And when I do that, I will take the same measurement and it actually tells me I have negative 13.62. So as you can see, when you go with the range closest to your measurement, you can get more precise measurements for it. And so that's how you would measure current. You have to physically insert your meter in line with where you're trying to measure it in order to get a value. And now I'll show you on the other multimeters. Sorry, the angry beeping again. It's a nice feature to have, as annoying as it might sound. So I will go straight to Harbor Freight here, and we'll see if we can get it to <laughs> replicate. <laughs> yeah. So Harbor Freight's multimeter has a DC amp value with a 20 milliamp range, which should work. Also, notice that instead, uh, on my multimeter, I had one for, yeah, I guess they're all my multimeters, but. <laughs> Yeah, on this one, you have one that shows uh, ohms, voltage, and capacitance, as well as temperature, and a totally separate plug for milliamps and microamps. On the Harbor Freight meter, you have one plug hole here that works for voltage, ohms, and milliamps. And this meter does not measure capacitance at all. So that's another reason to get a nicer multimeter if you find yourself needing to measure capacitance. So let's try this. I've set it to 20 milliamps. Since we already measured it and know it's 13, I probably won't set anything on fire. No promises. <laughs> um, and now here. Okay, so what you're seeing here is that I have no current flowing through, which is a problem I have with this multimeter all the time. These plugs are very crappy 
and when I plug them in half the time I do not get current to flow through them. So I will attempt to replug it a couple times and if that doesn't work I'll switch multimeters again. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I tried prying them open so they would spring better but I guess taking it out to show you the plug was more than it could handle tonight, so the demo gods of Harbor Freight are not with me, but I will show you on my second crappiest multimeter how this should work. So this one, it only has two plugs in it, just how they did it internally. So if I come down here to DC milliamps, you can see there's a setting for 25 as a maximum. Since we should be getting 13, that will work. And then if you look up on the readout, again for this one, voltage and milliamps have the same scale. They're the three black rows in the middle. Since my maximum is 25, I can look at the 250 row and divide by 10, or the 50 row and divide by two. There's a lot more work you have to do with these than if you get one with a digital readout. Again, unless you happen to have one of these, I recommend getting a digital multimeter. But you should still be able to see it completes the circuit and we're getting a reading of, that looks like about 130, 140, which is in the range of what we would expect. Because again, you divide, sorry. Can you see on there the needle by the 150 number a bit lower? Is it readable? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so you have to divide by 10, <laughs> but yeah. So you can make these work, it's a lot harder. Again, I recommend digital. So that's how you measure current. You have to insert the multimeter in the path of the electrons in order to measure them. And now I will restore the circuit to lightfulness and we will move on. If I wake up my laptop, okay. So, the next important item I would like to discuss is resistance, which you brought up earlier. So, resistance is a property of a substance that flows down, or slows down the flow of electrons. That applies in the type of electricity we're talking about, which again is free electrons moving through a conductive surface, not so much in the charge moving through a medium like radio would be. Radio's word for resistance is inductance, and it's more complicated than that, but that's a general idea. So if you hear inductance, you can just think uh, AC or radio resistance. So the resistance is measured in ohms, OHMS. Its symbol is the capital letter omega. So it looks like an O with a couple of feet or kind of an egg sitting on a hill, I've heard it described. <laughs> um, so the resistance of a component depends on the component's properties. Typically, resistors are treated as a fixed value. So you buy a resistor and it just comes in a resistance number like 100 ohms, and that's an intrinsic property of the material. But in reality, it's more complicated than that. And resistors have data sheets, and if you pump a lot more current through it, it'll heat up and the material properties will change. 99% of the time, the number written on the resistor is close enough to reality that you don't need to worry about that. So voltage across a resistor is not fixed, which you can see here. So on the circuit I built, I have two resistors of the same value but we measured different voltages on them. One was, I think, 2.9 and the other was uh, 2.6 or something along those lines. So just know that voltage is not constant in a resistor, but its resistance is. And we'll very soon be discussing why that is. So the fluid analogy for a resistor is you've got your pipe, you've got your water flowing through it, and someone takes a big clump of hair and sticks it in there and the water has to slow down to get past that clump of hair. Alternatively, you can think of it like you have an old pipe full of calcium deposits that have shrunk the diameter and it's harder for the water to get past that. It kind of sticks to the edges more and that slows the water down. So essentially a resistor keeps the flow of electrons from moving as quickly. And fast moving electrons are what results in fire. So resistors are the way to prevent fire. <laughs> And I'll get into more specifically how you can figure out how likely things are to catch on fire in just a moment. <laughs> so 
When we come to resistors, you will see these things all over the internet. It is a resistor color diagram. They, here, I will... Make me cry. Yeah, if you would like to zoom in on the overhead, I'm gonna try and do this. Can I put this up where it's visible? Not at all. Okay, I'll try the other direction. Woo. Wow. Set it on the ground. Let's try that. So this is going to demonstrate my next point really well for you in that it's really, really hard to read these. <laughs> <laughs> um, where's my focusy button? Wrong way. Oh, it's on autofocus and oh, it's ignoring yeah. me. There we yeah. go. Okay, so can you guys tell what those colors are? So, with my actual eyeballs, it's easier to see that it's brown, black, brown, white, and brown. So if we go back to the slide, you would look here. So we have a resistor with five bands on it, which looks like this. We have brown, black, brown, then white, Huh, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've got a quality resistor. You want to use the next band. Huh? Oh, I want the this one? The last band is your quality rating. Oh, yeah, there you go. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that color codes can technically tell you what a resistor is, but the best way to figure it out is to get out your multimeter and actually measure the resistance. So, we're back to the slideshow, but I've moved the resistor so you can't see it. Um, what you can't see on the screen right now is that my multimeter is now set to the ohm symbol for measuring ohms. I once again take the probes, and I guess I'll zoom out. You've seen how, how hard it is to read resistor values, right? Okay, so to make this more reliable, I'm just going to insert the resistor in the breadboard because otherwise they tend to roll away. Now I touch each side of the resistor legs and the ohm reading shows up as 192.1. So the same thing would work on, I'll just skip to Harbor Freight really quick. As you can see on here, we have a range for, oh, I guess you can't see. Let's do the zoomy. Is it easier to see now that under the ohm symbol, there's a whole range from 2000K, 200K, 20K, 2000, and 200. So we already know this resistor's in the 190 range, and I'm less likely to, s oh wait, I switched to Harbor Freight, didn't I? Hey, it thinks it's connected again. It also wants a new battery. Oh, well, that's because I never use it, and this thing's like 10 years old, but. I will now try to measure the resistor on the 200 ohm rating, and it gives me nothing because Harbor Freight demo gods hate me, but you get the general idea. And this resistance is measured across the resistor. One important thing to note, you cannot measure the resistance in a live circuit. So, oh, I was using the wrong probes. <laughs> Yeah, so that was my good multimeter beeping and the other, yeah. Anyway, I will now try to measure the resistor in circuit. We're not and laughing at you, we're just laughing with you. You should be laughing at me. So when I measure the resistor in circuit, I get a value of zero. But if I measure the same, huh? Oh, sorry. So this resistor here in the LED circuit, it does not give me a valid reading because essentially none of the current wants to flow through the resistor when it can flow through the multimeter, so it screws with the reading apparatus built inside of it. You can ignore the why, but just always remember you have to remove your resistor before you can get a reading. Oh, and you can't see the reading, sorry. So here you get a reading of zero, here you get a reading of the correct value 192. So always remove resistors, capacitors, inductors from the circuit before measuring them. 
things need to be in the circuit and working for you to measure voltage and current. So that's a handy thing to think about. And we can go back to slideies now. So now we get to the crux of what I have come here to teach you, which is the math behind all of this and how it ties together. So it sounds, it's very easy math. I mean, I even have this handy chart up here. So if you're not very good at math, it basically solves the algebra for you. If you know algebra, there are two things to remember. The first is Ohm's law, which is written as V equals I times R. Sometimes if you're European, you'll see it as E equals I times R. They use E for voltage in this equation in Europe for reasons unknown to me. Um, so in this case, voltage is in volts, current is in amps, and resist, uh, yeah, resistance is in ohms. So what that means is if you have a 200 kilo ohm resistor, you have to insert into this equation 200,000 for the ohm value. If you have measured like we have around 13 milliamps, you have to insert into this equation 0 0.013 amps. And the same is true for voltage. If you have like 30, milli or 30 millivolts, you have to insert 0 0.03 volts. So keep track of your units when you're using this or it won't work. Um, yeah. I got that. So the second super important equation is the power equation. And that is P is equal to I times V. Or if you're in Europe, they all remember it by saying pi. P equals IE. And power is the thing that will tell you when something is about to catch on fire. So these two equations are very important. Um, this is called the Ohm's Law Wheel. If you just Google Ohm's Law, it will pop up in all the Google results. So here, if you want to find R, and you know V or I, R is equal to V over I. If you want to find R, and you know V and P for power, R is equal to V squared over P. If you want to know R, and you know P and I, then R is equal to P over I squared. So does that make sense? Oh, we have a visitor behind the window. <laughs> okay. Pay no attention to the man behind the screen. Yeah, so this is essentially just solving these two equations for what you don't know. So you can insert into the power equation. Since V is equal to IR, if you insert IR into the power equation, you get I times I times R. So P should be equal to I squared times R. And if you look up here, P is equal to R times I squared. So all this wheel is doing is just, it does the algebra for you if you're not comfortable doing algebra. If you're comfortable with algebra, you just have to remember these two equations and that will solve Ohm's law for you. So the next thing, a few, things about Ohm's law. It does not work in every situation, but it works often enough that it's usually all you will need to go to. So for instance, incandescent bulbs, if you measure the resistance of that and then turn it on, the tungsten gets so hot that its resistance changes when it's in the circuit. So you would not get an accurate calculation knowing the voltage across it and the resistance. Um, Pretty much any time you're using a component where Ohm's law does not apply, if you open up the data sheet, there will be graphs that show you at this current, your resistance will be this, or at this voltage, your resistance will be this. So when Ohm's law applies, they won't tell you anything because that's the default. <coughs> when you're working with resistors, that's almost always going to work for Ohm's law. And resistors is the most common place to use Ohm's law. So we'll go into examples with our circuit again in a moment, but I just want to make you aware that it's called a law, but it does not apply to every situation. In the situations it doesn't apply, read your data sheets, it will tell you. Not 
in the exact words, hey, Ohm's law doesn't apply, but if there's a bunch of graphs for operating voltage against current, that's what it's telling you, is that instead of using Ohm's law, look on this graph to find what your current will be. Which is why you can't use it with batteries. Yep, batteries have weird chemical properties, so a resistance measured through a battery is kind of like trying to measure the resistor in a circuit. It doesn't give you valid numbers because the meter doesn't understand the chemical nature of the voltage. Okay, so moving on, we're going to look for Ohm's law in action. So we have measured a voltage across this resistor of 4.5 volts. We know the resistor's value is 100 ohms because the schematic calls for a 100 ohm resistor. That is something I forgot to mention early on, sorry, but if you look on the schematic, we have R1, which is just a number. Typically when you get a printed circuit board back, it will have R1 written on it somewhere. So if you're trying to figure out what's going on in a circuit, there's labels to help you go from the schematic to the board. In the example of ours, I would have to write R1 on the red LED resistor and R2 on the blue LED resistor so they can be differentiated. Uh, anyway, underneath the number designation, you also get a value of, typically on a computer, they'll write R100 instead of 100 ohms. It's also common to see something like R10K, which means 10 kilo ohms. So the resistance value would be 10,000 in ohms. Um, anyway, so we know voltage is four and a half volts and resistance is 100 volts. If we use Ohm's law, which is V equals I times R, 4.5 volts equals I times 100. So if you take 4.5 and divide by 100, that solves for I and you get 0 0.045 amps, which is 45 milliamps. So in our actual example, we measure a, here I'll just do this real quick again. I will measure on the red resistor, we have a voltage of 3.462, and we know the resistance is 192. So let me pull up my handy calculator. Oh, sorry. So what did I just say, three point something? 3.462. Okay. Yep, so we go with 3.462 divided by uh, 192, and we get a value of 18 milliamps. Do we? What did I do? Oh, I did 0.192, sorry. 3.462 over 192. Yeah, 0 0.018 amps. That's what it should be. I'm sorry, I fat fingered that. So we should have 18 milliamps going through the red LED. And we can check that by setting our multimeter to current, splitting up the circuit so our meter, so the electrons have to flow through our meter. And then I will connect the circuit here. And I get a value of, what, 17 point something. It's kind of flickering a bit, yeah. 17.5 or 6, so close, but not exactly right. And I'm betting this resistor has a slightly different value than the 192 I measured on the one out of the circuit, which is why the numbers differ. The important thing to take away is that about 20 milliamps is good enough. So with most LEDs, if they're not super, super tiny, Typically, if you keep the current under 30 milliamps, they will not explode. If you exceed that, they will die. So when you're trying to pick a resistor for an LED, you figure out what the voltage of the LED is, and then you can find the voltage across the resistor. And if your current works out to be 30 or less, it's probably acceptable and your LED will light up without blowing up. So that's a practical use for Ohm's law. Now if we go back to here, I will kill the calculator. We can also figure out the power in this resistor. So power is kind of the catch-all for how to know if your component will explode. 
Um, so power is equal to current times voltage. We know that the current we just calculated in this case was 0 0.045 amps and our voltage is 4.5 volts. So we have 0 0.2025 watts and watt is the unit of power. I think it was on the slide, but I didn't say it out loud before now. So um, what that tells me is that this is just under what you'd call a quarter watt. And the size of resistors I've been using all night that are probably like, what, seven or eight centimeters long by two or three in diameter. Kilowatt? No, they're quarter watt resistors. So if you look at, I've got a whole bag of these things oh, here. you got the blue ones. Yeah, they're, so essentially as long as you don't exceed the wattage rating of your component, then you won't have any problems using it. So in the case of quarter watt resistors, as long as your power is less than one quarter watt, you won't have issues with it overheating or catching on fire or exploding. LEDs will also have current ratings but not power ratings because they're likely to explode just from current and their voltage is pretty much constant for whatever light level they're at. So. It's technically a power rating, but it'll show up on data sheets as just current. The key takeaway is that you calculate the power in your component, and the data sheet for your component should tell you what the maximum allowable power is. As long as you are less than the maximum allowable power, your component should operate fine. If you're very close or start pushing the envelope, then you're likely to get fires or the parts may work fine for a while and start to break down. So that's the, another handy use of Ohm's law and the power equation. So the last topic I would like to cover is Kirchhoff's or Kirchhoff's circuit laws. I've had three electrical engineering classes and I've heard professors one said Kirchhoff, one said Kirchhoff, and the other switched between them seemingly at random. So I do not know to this day which is correct. YouTube videos seem to split it down the middle. What does Google say? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, I'll let someone else ask Google. So um, the first one that I will talk about is Kirchhoff's or Kirchhoff's current law, KCL is how it's commonly abbreviated. So the way it's stated officially is that it is the sum of currents in a network of conductors meeting at a node is equal to zero. And the layman's way of saying it is current into a node has to equal current out of a node. And I'll give you an example of that here in just a second. The second one is Kirchhoff's voltage law. And that is said that the directed sum of the potential differences or voltages around any closed loop is equal to zero. So when he says directed, that brings up the point I made earlier where if you go from positive to negative, you get a positive voltage. And if you go from negative to positive, you get a negative voltage. So that comes into play in Kirchhoff's voltage law. And again, I'll have an example here in just a second. So we are back to our example with two LEDs. And what I've done is I took the numbers from the example before. So we know through this resistor there is 45 milliamps. And that means that going into this resistor is 45 milliamps and coming out of this resistor is 45 milliamps. So that's our calculated value from the example. In the real world example we came up with 17 or 18 and that's the number we would use. So we want to find out how much current is coming into this node. So we know all the values except one for the node. And let's see. So Kirchhoff's current law states that the sum of all the currents through a node is equal to zero. And we know the current for, because of Ohm's law or because we measured it. So there's only one unknown for this node, and that means we can use Kirchhoff's current law to solve it. And Kirchhoff's laws, unlike Ohm's law, do apply in all cases. 
Okay, so the equation would be, so everything adds up to zero, and we have x, and as you can see, current has a direction, so the arrow says that the current is flowing into the node. So if you measured it with your negative here, and your positive on one of the resistor legs, you would get a positive number, because the current is flowing from the negative side to the positive side. So you've got plus x flowing into the node, and then you have minus 45 milliamps. So the minus is key here because it's going from the node out into the resistor. And the same happens here. You go from the node out into the resistor. So, um, yeah, that's me rambling about negatives again. If you solve this equation by <coughs> adding 45 to the equation twice, you get x is equal to 90 milliamps. So if you have 45 milliamps going into one resistor, 45 milliamps going into the other, you need 2 times 45, or 90 milliamps, coming into the node to make that work. So and we how can... how do you understand all of the weird FKCD jobs? Hmm? I've missed, missed those ones. Oh well, so does that kind of make sense to everybody? That current in equals current out for any node? And this is very helpful because you can measure the current on some things, but it may not be practical to cut open your circuit and measure it everywhere. So if you can calculate it with Ohm's law by measuring voltages, then you can figure out the total current that's being drawn on your battery. And batteries will also have a maximum power rating or a maximum current rating, depending on what you're reading, but it works out the same. Is that always going to split them evenly? No. So if, in our case, we had 13 milliamps in one and 17 in the other, so our total current should be somewhere around 13 plus 17 is 30. And we can actually check that right now. So I have to get creative here with how I split my circuit since everything's on a rail. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do can you give me a jumper wire, please? Okay, so uh, can you guys see the circuit now? So what I've done is instead of having my voltage source on the rails, I've moved it over into two of the smaller rows. And I'm going to connect the negative terminal of the battery back to minus and the positive terminal of the battery is just floating out here. Then I'm going to insert my multimeter in the middle and connect it back to the positive rail. And as you can see, we get a total current of about 31, which is in line with what we had measured earlier being added together on both nodes. So hooray, it worked. <laughs> I was really worried it wasn't going to. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, mostly just that I'd broken the circuit somehow. So did that make sense, how I measured this and how I kind of shifted the nodes around? It still makes physical sense as a circuit? Okay. Um, that because of the two different colors of LEDs? Yeah, so the different LEDs with the same resistors will give you different current ratings, because you have I think it was what 2.5 volts through or almost just 2 volts through the red LED and 2.6 volts through the blue LED. So that means you have less voltage across this resistor on the blue LED than you have across this resistor on the red LED. And how you can figure that out is again by measuring or we'll go back to slides by or oh, it helps if I click on the right screen, using Kirchhoff's voltage law. So I'm taking one of the LEDs out of the equation for simplicity, but we know our battery is 6 volts, or when you measure it, it's 6.08 or whatever we were getting. And we know the voltage across an LED, if you have a tiny red LED, it's usually around 1.5. The bigger ones tend to be higher. I'm not quite sure why, something, something physics. Um, anyway, these are our example numbers, and we can check the real numbers here in a second. So, you've got 6 volts there, an unknown amount, and 1.5 volts. 
And Kirchhoff's current law says the sum of all voltages around a closed loop is equal to zero. So in our case, this closed loop will be our one LED circuit. And if the other LED was there, this would still work. We just ignore that leg because that's a separate closed loop. So you just pick any arbitrary point and you can move along a wire through components however you feel like it and as long as you get back to that point Kirchhoff's voltage law will apply. So uh, I know we've measured all of these numbers several times but if we pretend we only know these two we'll solve for the third. And so I'm going to make the arbitrary decision to start at ground and go around this loop. So, going around the loop, you go from ground, from negative battery to positive battery, so that would be plus 6 volts, because you measured 6 volts across the battery, and you know that this is the positive side. If you measure and you get a negative value, you just, if you have a negative value, the side your red probe is on is the negative side. If you have a positive value, the side your red probe is on is the positive side. So hopefully that makes sense. Just keep track of negatives. They are very important when you're doing this math. You also go around here and you can just say plus x. If x turns out to be negative, it will just work out in the math, so you don't need to think too hard about it. Um, I recommend not adding a sign for x because when you solve it it may turn out to be negative and you can confuse yourself if you went minus x and then it's a negative which means it's actually positive. So always plus your unknown is my recommendation or hope you're really good at algebra. Um, finally we go from the positive side of this LED to the negative 1.5 volts so you because you go from positive to negative, you would subtract 1.5 volts. Again, signs are very important for Kirchhoff's laws. Solving this, you get that x is equal to minus 4.5 volts, which makes sense for these numbers, but not our real world example. I also threw in, yeah, so if you start at R1 and you do the same thing going backwards, you'll still get the same answer. So here you have x, again I say don't add a sign to it, always add x. Then you come up to the battery because you go from positive to negative, it's minus 6 volts. Keep going around your loop, then here you go from negative to positive, so it's plus 1.5 volts, and you're back to where we started and you come up with an answer of x is equal to positive 4.5 volts. So what that means is from here to here, from negative to positive, you get 4.5 volts. When you were going the other way, you went from positive to negative, and you got a negative number. So that just means that the positive side is this side in both cases. Hopefully the signs make sense. I know it can get a bit hairy, but I did I explain it well enough? Okay. And... Yeah, x equal to 4.5. Okay, so we are to the summary. That's all I wanted to teach you. Hooray! <laughs> the most important things to remember is the general idea that electricity is electrons flowing through a conductive material. Um, let's, I'll just look at it on this screen so I'm not staring at the wall. Um, voltage is analogous to pressure. It is an across variable. You measure it from one point to another point. Current is like flow, it's the flow of the electrons, and that is a through variable, so you have to insert your meter into the path of flow to measure it. Um, hopefully you've got a generally good idea of how to use a multimeter from all my fumbling around up here. And then the biggest takeaways mathematically to help you figure out schematics and what's going on, Ohm's law V equals I times R, that is huge. You'll use it all the time. If you want a racist professor's take on this, uh, okay. um, I was taught the vulture see, or the Indian sees the vulture over the rabbit. So huh. um, I equals V divided by R. And I've never forgotten that one because it's terrible. <laughs> Okay, well, if that helps anyone, great. <laughs> if 
If not, oh well. Um, yeah, so V equals I times R. You can also just Google Ohm's law and get that circle up if it helps. You also have the power equation, which will help you determine if you're going to set something on fire. P is equal to current times voltage. Kirchhoff's current law says current into a node is the same as the current out of a node. And Kirchhoff's voltage law says that the voltage around any closed loop will always add up to zero. So that's my presentation. And I'm happy to answer any questions or let people build the circuit themselves and play with multimeters as much as you want after we're done. Yeah, same here. You guys can mess with this yeah. one. Uh, this may be outside the scope of what you were talking about, but does power really have kind of, is it a real thing or is it just an abstraction to kind of explain the re relationship between current and voltage? Um, I do not remember enough of my physics classes in college to know the answer to that explicitly, okay. but I mean, all of this is kind of a way to explain physical phenomenon, right. and power is basically kind of like how much it can take before it dies, okay. at least now, as far as are electronics. Not heat, but they relate very closely. Yeah. You, technically, you go to, from watts to calories. Yeah, watt okay. is a unit of uh, energy per second, okay. so it's how much power, I mean, how much energy is being consumed by the system or component. That makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions? Anyone still awake? Maybe. Hooray! <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Hopefully it was helpful and informative.